Hey everybody, welcome back. I'm just gonna wait a couple of minutes just to let everyone in the room. Last time we started, there was like a two minute uh, wait uh, and then people were telling me afterwards that they missed out on my, my intro. So I better uh, let everyone in the door. I've changed position today, so I'm no longer against the cupboard. I've got the, uh, got the, got the lighting fixed, which is better. Um, was that a feedback? <laughs> that was the feedback from last time. <laughs> the lighting wasn't great. <laughs> It's all good. All right. Well, we may as well get started. Look, thank you so much for everyone here for, for joining us today for our sixth industry webinar focused on uh, really practical optimism in the international education sector during the COVID-19 pandemic. This week, we focus on the student perspective. And really, I'm looking forward to speaking with with this person. He's the, he's the National President of the Council of International Students Australia, Ahmed Adamoglu. He's about, he's, we're going to talk about the important work that CESA is doing in advocating for student needs. My name is James Martin. Uh, I run Insider Guides. Uh, we create guides and online content to prepare, welcome and support international students. Uh, and we also really help or, or any organisation that wants to speak to international students at various stages of their journey. At the moment, where though we've been doing a lot of these webinars and we've really been trying to be the, I guess, the conduit between students and the industry and really just trying to keep a, a really positive conversation going during this time. And that's what these webinars are about. That's why we've been doing all these industry chats as well. And uh, at the end of this webinar, you will receive a, uh, there'll, there'll be a, a survey. So please, I would love, uh, I'd love to, uh, if you could fill, fill that in, it makes these a lot better. Uh, there'll be some polls, which I'll launch soon as well, which will make it a bit more interactive. And um, yeah, before any, any, before any more, I'd like to introduce our speaker. So Ahmed is uh, originally from Turkey. He's studying, uh, he's studying nursing at Curtin University, and he came to Australia in 2011. During his studies, he became a student leader, which he has led to multiple leadership positions since. So Ahmed is the current president of CESA and following two years as national vice president, he's a very active student. I don't think I was that active when I was in uh, uni. He's also appointed as a board member to the Study Perth board in uh, June 2019. Ahmed, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you for the invitation, James. Great to be here. Great. Well, the, the staggering impact, I guess, you know, it is, it's a huge impact of COVID-19 on education systems around the world is unlike anything we have seen in the post-war era, really. More than 1.6 billion students have been affected, representing around 91% of all students in the world. It is a momentous time in our history where uncertainty is perhaps the only certainty. And CESA have been actively advocating for additional student support. And, you know, it's, it's great to see. I mean, CESA C, uh, started a few years ago, back when I first started in, in Sutter Guides, and it was, um, it was a small group. And it's just amazing to see how students can get together and really do something fantastic and really stand up for the rights of international students. And, um, you know, I'm really happy to speak to you today, Ahmed. It's great. Ahmed, I mean, can you tell us a bit more about some of the immediate needs of students that you're working with to, you know, to address the, to, to address through CESA's action plan? Sure. I'll look, it's, I think it's our 10th anniversary uh, now, and, and uh, there was a previous organization uh, before CESA uh, called NLC. Uh, CESA was following after that. Um, and I think it's been a great journey for student advocacy and, uh, you know, it's, quite interesting times that we're going through right now um, as, as you mentioned uh, the, the, and it's hard times as well we have been hearing moving stories from uh, from the student cohort um, I think some of the immediate needs and uh, the inquiries that we are getting is around um, accommodation is a really important one um, financial help uh, emotional support we heard some really sad stories uh, from um, different states and territories um, and also the current discussion around online learning um, and, and value for um, education and the investment, um, as well as some people who are stuck outside the country uh, and they can't um, come back in and their families are in Australia now, uh, nowadays. Um, they've got their wife or children in Australia. And we are hearing you know, such stories and I think we are lucky to be right on the ground with students and that we're trying to disseminate information in both ways um, from the government 
and the sector to the students and from the students uh, to the sector and government. Yeah, I mean, it's a, um, I think you guys play a really important role, uh, especially right now when, when I guess the support for international students has been, you know, all, all over the media. I saw 7.30 last night, there was a big story on that. Uh, you know, I guess, so CISA originally established uh, well, CESA recently established a COVID-19 welfare campaign, which aims to be the advocacy voice in enacting change, achieving welfare necessities and protecting the rights for international students. I guess it's, uh, it's an interesting one. Do, do, do you feel CESA, it, it should be up to CESA themselves to be advocating for sort of basic needs? You know, do, do you feel like there's like a government failure right here? I guess I'm just cu curious to feel whether or not it should be up to the students advocating for basic human rights in, in, this, in this way. I think naturally students are advocating um, every day without an organization anyways. Like for example, you're feeling uh, unwell and you go to your tutor or lecturer um, and you, know, you tell them that you're not um, doing well or you tell your um, student peers and maybe it is you know, carried from the chain of command. Uh, the, lecturer might you know raise it with the unit coordinator unit coordinator might you know raise it with the upper chain and it might uh, maybe go to academic board or some of the other uh, boards or um, you know the, to the management of the institution so it was naturally happening um, anyways but i think having institutions uh, leading this it gives power i think it gives strength to those um, individuals and organizations in the sector who are also defending student rights who are also caring about student welfare. So I think it, it gives a, I'd like to call it credible advocacy. So it's not just one person or, you know, 10 or 12 people's uh, ideas. It's, it's, it's more than that. It's, uh, you know, you're, you're hearing those stories from the, from the ground and you're carrying it and you're advocating for them. So, uh, you know, there are other organizations like ISANA uh, who have been uh, doing this work more than us and, and they are professional staff as well. And you know they were advocating for student rights. So there are a lot of um, organisations, a lot of individuals out there, and government departments as well who were, um, you know, doing this work. I think um, CISA's position and presence was complementary to that process. Uh, CISA is not the only one advocate, advocating for student rights, uh, and um, but from this current process, I think we've seen it more and more. Uh, it was it was really prevalent out there that there was a lot of support for. Um, international students and and we were sometimes surprised uh, by the you know partners that we were working with because you wouldn't normally expect them to uh, do such work on the ground but you know because of this issue we have we have seen um, interesting um, you know partners that we we get to work with well let's talk about some of that support now i mean it's been in the media and been pretty widely reported where the gaps have been i'd love to talk about where what you feel about this what, what, what responses have you had from government, universities, private providers and businesses that provide service to international students? It was mainly collaborative. Um, and uh, there were interesting conversations as well. And when sometimes people are stuck uh, because of their internal politics or, or government politics that um, you know, they express their empathy and sympathy as well, but they also you know, outline their position and it gives us um, a clear picture of you know, where they stand. And we're not asking too much from those individuals or, um, or, or those, those partners anyways. Uh, you know, naturally everybody has, um, you know, their uh, things that they are doing, their objectives and also things they are expected from them. Uh, you know, when we talk to government, um, I was sometimes surprised because that uh, they, they were, for example, raising an agenda item where we haven't thought of before, but it was quite obvious. Um, or sometimes we were, they were hearing things that we didn't hear before and we go and test it out. And, you know we find it's true it happens to it happens both ways as well for example we bring some items that nobody's heard of before uh, because we are hearing from students on the ground um, and uh, i think I, i've really enjoyed uh, this current crisis in a way because uh, <laughs> as much was, as you can <laughs> yes yes in, in, interestingly because i mean we, we we heard really sad stories i've been getting calls every day emails every day from individual students um, trying to help them out but at the same time, I try to look at the positive side of things and try to get some positive reinforcement. Mm. I think we have really seen um, the strength that the sector has uh, in Australia. Um, yes, I know we compare different uh, countries doing different campaigns, but when you look at the whole sector, I don't think there's any other example uh, 
like I don't think there is any other country doing an ex officio welcoming an international student uh, in a council with five federal ministers, for example, just like we have in Australia's um, Council for International Education. Uh, we, we can we can see students you know advocating for themselves in every uh, you know almost in every government department through their uh, mm. advocacy uh, through their advisory boards um, and some other some of the other meetings. So uh, generally. So it was welcoming, it was collaborative, and um, we have received a lot of praise and uh, you know, a lot of support from uh, the sector, uh, you know, which, was, which was good. But of course, there were things that we, we couldn't achieve yet. Um, and, and there were times that we were frustrated. Uh, and um, I always say this um, when, when we sometimes talk about the media statements or things that we comment. I think within the household, um, let's say, in, imagine, imagine the household, let's say you're in your family in the house. I mean, you can fight, there will be ups and downs. But when you go outside, um, you know, you don't tell your problems to other people, to other families. So I think that's what we're doing as well. We, we try and hold on to it really strong. To, you know, we're really advocating for student rights within Australia. But when we meet with people from different um, countries or different sectors globally, we tell them that, look, you know, our sector is quite strong. Uh, and we tell them the examples that we have and the opportunities that we've had for student advocacy. And, and that has been quite powerful. Like for example, last week we've had the um, New Zealand international student president in our round table. Uh, we talked about similarities and differences as well. Um, she was surprised to hear uh, the, some of the things that we were doing and some of the seats that we've got within government and, and sector. But, and we, we were also surprised to see that we had a lot of uh, similar issues that you know, both countries were facing. That's a, uh, I guess it's an interesting one there because, you know, on one hand, you're on, you're in, you're in the room with politicians, you know, they're listening to you, but I think large parts of the community would say that international students have gotten a pretty bad deal from, you know, the immediate financial response from the federal government hasn't really been there. We were just speaking before going through some of the options, we went through rent moratoriums, welfare, visa extensions, reduction in tuition, fee, some of the stuff that, that CESA really wants to see. And, uh, you know, just the, the rent moratorium, for example, we were speaking about that before it started. That, that's an example of, 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 of this was a, a well-intentioned piece of policy to support people. But international students, you know, when they first come to Australia, often they're not taking out a head lease. You know, they are often... Uh, housemates do you feel there's sort of there's a lot of students just sort of slipping through the cracks here definitely i think um, you know we, we we only get to hear from those people if they have gone through the process and um, you know only from those organizations who are also you know talking on a daily basis to those students for example um, i think eviction was one of the um, topics is We've heard stories where people were just um, sleeping on their um, friends, uh, you know, uh, floor uh, and in their room or in their house. And we have people who are uh, couch surfing as well. So, uh, you know, stories that we hear uh, are, are quite sad. And mm. um, and it's correct that you know they're not meant to be evicted. Um, at but we are still hearing those people who are in formal agreement are trying to be evicted their properties or where they stay we I've, I've heard this yesterday from some of the community organizations they raised with me uh, we are also hearing that some of the students who are not formally in the agreement let's say there is only one person person in the tenancy agreement uh, but all the other three people are not in the agreement but they live there so uh, their situation is quite different if they can't pay rent because if they want to seek help from um, any of the agencies they, they, they don't have any formal proof that they live there. Um, so this is, I think, one of the one of the examples that you know the, there is there is help, there is there is support, there is effort, but we also have people uh, slipping through the cracks. For instance, when you're applying for uh, a grant from your institution, let's say, and let's say you also want to apply for another grant uh, from a not-for-profit organization, usually the question that you get asked is. Uh, which institution are you coming from? Does your institution give grant? And if you have, and also it asks, have you applied for a grant from another institution before? And if you click on yes, usually you don't get a chance to get a grant. They say, oh, you've already got immediate help from somebody else. So 
So let's say you clicked on um, yes, you know, that's a no for you. And then you go to your institution, uh, your institution is asking the same questions as well. We've, we've, we've heard cases where they were refused from uh, both of those parties because they were applying for two grants. Or for instance, they applied for a grant from, uh, you know, let's say Red Cross, but they haven't had a response for like a week. And at the same time, they decided to apply for another grant in university just because they applied for two grants they don't get a chance um, to get help and they are refused from both parties. So, you know, I think we've got very detailed issues, but it's very popular as well. It's very common and, and, and we are hearing, you know, issues like that uh, on, on daily basis. That's terrifying actually to hear that, that there are students who genuinely need support, but because of a technical, you know, yeah, I mean, that's awful. Go, you go to the Red Cross and you click on, I need money. And then because you've, you may have, you may be eligible for, you know, 500 bucks from your university or something like that. You don't get any money from the Red Cross. That's another thing I've been, um, I've been doing some work with a whole bunch of study bodies across Australia and, and, and uh, it's, I, I'm not convinced students know where to look at the moment. I think they're a bit confused. I think there's, there is support coming from, you know, institutions, government, federal, local council, uh, you know, accommodation providers, state government, federal government, some, but I don't know. I mean, I saw the other day in Melbourne, there were a whole bunch of uh, the Brazilian embassy had organized like a food hamper uh, thing to be, they were giving out, they were giving out food to international students in the middle of Melbourne. But I don't think, I mean, the students that were, I was, I was speaking to, I don't, I don't think they knew. I don't think they knew about that. So it was just this huge disconnect. And right now it's all, it's coming from all angles. And we've got this issue where students are looking and trying to get support, but then either, not eligible because of those technicalities or, or they don't even know what, where, where to look. So I think this is the part where, you know, CESA can step up as also the state governments and study bodies are doing such a good job of trying to fill those gaps. It's really interesting. Uh, and the federal government, of course, Austrade is doing an amazing job of trying to aggregate all this uh, in a really good way. So, um, you know, I hope, I hope the momentum continues in the sector and it really is sort of that in this together. I know it's that campaign again, but uh, it's true. You know, we, you've got to, you've got to sort of keep, keep the net wide. Um, I'll move on a little bit. I mean, the, the federal government has confirmed, I mean, we heard from Scott Morrison a few days ago saying that, well, he didn't confirm it actually. He, uh, he, he raised the idea that, uh, that, that potentially there could be some exemptions for international students from Australia as early as July. Uh, which is you know, a delight for the sector who are listening right now. Um, but, you know, of course, there's strict uh, quarantine measures in place. I spoke with Simon Emmett, who is the CEO of IDP Connect in, in the UK last week about they had this recent study. And, they, and in that study, they were saying that, you know, the vast majority of international students still intend on coming to Australia. They're not, they're not put off, essentially, by this global pandemic, just this casual global pandemic to the side. You know, is this good news for 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 CISA? I mean, do, do you think do you think this will do? You, I guess do you think it'll pr pr produce a, a good result in the end, or will this just cause additional stress on the sector that already has limited support for the current international students? I think it's good and bad. Um, it's 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 good because students will be able to return to um, to their studies, but at the same time. We really need to be careful because, uh, you know, we there are people who are out there. They are not so much, uh, you know, welcoming for international students. And uh, you know, we will give them an opportunity to say that, you know, look, borders are opening again, and international students will come. And you know, you will have this, you know, energy in the society thinking that, oh, you know, is the, is the virus numbers are going to increase again because they don't see the behind. They don't see behind the scenes that there is so much work going on. Department of Health is involved. You know, police forces is involved and. There is you know, advice from all these people and it's you know, prepared as a package together before the border is open. And, you know, and, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if, I, if I've seen some comments from the public like that. So we, that's why I think we really need to be careful and, you know, really enforce uh, that, you know, social license that we always talk about. Um, you know, the community awareness of international education uh, and international students. Just this morning, we were talking with the um, council members uh, from Council of International Education, um, and we were talking about this community awareness part. And you know, I think 
uh, you know, we've discussed that it goes two ways. One, we really need to educate our national leaders and tell them about the importance of international education. Um, I know which is a tricky part. And the second part is, you know, we, we also need to raise awareness within the community. Um, you know, there is this stigma that international students are stealing, um, you know, university uh, seats from domestic students and things like that. You know, we really need to break those stigmas and, you know, and hearsay. So uh, we also have uh, people thinking that, you know, international students are a burden on the country, but they don't realize that, you know, international students are creating over 100,000 jobs across Australia. You know, average university degree costs like $100,000 cash. You know, when we tell this to domestic you know, students, sometimes they get surprised. They, they can't even believe us that we're paying that much and it's not through hex or anything like that. Um, I think uh, there is a good opportunity for us to bring a good package. Uh, and I think that's what federal government is doing now. Anyways, I had a chat with Minister Ellen Touch, um, I think Minister for Immigration. Uh, and, and his plan is uh, to empower the sector, the states and territories to come up with their packages on how we can reopen borders. I think uh, it is aligned with South Australia uh, Premier's proposal to federal government, um, their pilot project about how the border can be opened for international students. And I think it was well played. It'll increase the market value uh, for that state. You know, they will be the first one to open. It'll be a pilot project. Um, and I think other states will be able to follow up if everything is going good. And, you know, there's a plus that, you know, there are COVID-19 cases, um, you know, it's flattening every day. So the numbers are looking good. Um, so there are good opportunities. There are good settings out there. We are pushing some of the other states and territories to do the same, you know, to step up and, and take initiative. And we are saying that you in return, you will benefit from this um, as well. And as you're aware, there are political challenges um, mm -hmm. out there and, uh, you know, which really is a bit frustrating uh, because not everybody cares about international students and international uh, education. Uh, people are always thinking for the next elections, so which is a bit burden uh, for us when we are advocating. But uh, I, I can see that I think uh, that there will be, uh, so we, we had a chat with Home Affairs as well. Um, we are talking about this conditional visa. So students at least will feel safe, you know, saying that, okay, in, you know, in, uh, now or tomorrow, I will be able to return. Because at the moment, there is this uh, you know, tendency to, to think that you know, I'm not gonna be able to return. So there is this stress now, and, and that stress is burdening them and putting them on you know, emotional, emotional struggle. And I think it is upcoming now, it's a bit slow. Uh, we are pushing uh, the department to you know, come up with as soon as possible. I'm also aware that there, are, there is a specific visa for I think COVID, coronavirus, COVID-19, um, and Last week, I have given a suggestion to Minister Touch. I said, um, I think we need more sympathy uh, from the government. And he said, um, he, he mentioned about his Twitter comments and his media statements. And I said, uh, you know, why not just send an email out to all the international students and their families, you know, expressing your sympathies. You don't have to go in public. You can just do it because you've got the data and you've got the emails of all these students. And he said, that was a really great idea. Uh, and you know, I, I said it'll, it'll go a long way because it'll give them a support and it will uh, make it look like government is trying to support um, international students, uh, you, you know, even though there are struggles and even though some other countries are looking like they are doing better work, uh, we, 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 we tried to push that national picture actually, but it didn't work. Mm. When I had a chat with Minister Dan Tien last week, I, you know, I also mentioned the same thing two weeks ago as well. I said, Minister, we really need to come up with a clear picture, a visible saying that this is what we are giving to support international students. At the moment, it is all confusing. Different states and territories have different packages. Different institutions have different packages as well. We can't really see that national picture. Students are confused as well. They come to us saying, oh, look, my institution is not giving any support, but I can hear other universities are giving support. What can I do? Uh, they are coming to us saying, you know, when is my state going to announce uh, their packages? We are hearing these stories. So the, the, the picture is a bit complex now. Uh, well, our initial plan, initial lobbying plan was that uh, federal government was going to come up with a package and states and territories were going to, uh, you know, build on it. Um, and, and we were going to have this national picture, but things changed along the way. And, uh, you know, it went uh, other way around. So now, government is expect, expecting states, states and territories to come first and saying, um, you know, after 
it's all complete, we're going to come up with this national picture and say we will, um, you know, give you're giving this to international students. But but we've also flagged that it's you know we will be followers. We won't be pioneers um, in the global media. Yeah, it must be it must be tricky working for the federal government right now. I think because you know there's full of people who really do actually want to help international students. But you know even. Dan Tian, who who puts out on Twitter, you know, we're we're in this we're in this together. We want to support international students, and then you can see the comments in his Twitter feed. It's just like, yeah, well, if that's the case, how come the wage subsidy wasn't extended to international students? You know, it just must be so hard. Uh, yeah. um, I mean, I, I tend to agree in terms of the travel restrict, uh, travel restrictions. I guess, I guess the way I see it, and I was speaking to Dirk Mulder yesterday a little bit, uh, who's a who used to be the director of international at. Um, in Murdoch and at UNESA, and now he's a consultant in Perth. He was saying that the that that and and until the Australian public really uh, understand that international students aren't tourists, they're here to to live, and they have that more work slash migratory uh, focus, uh, and and the education facilities can sort of help to communicate those benefits at the at exactly this time. Uh, then if, they, if, the, if the education sector can get that across the line and bring the public with them and the, and the government can sort of back it up, then, then opening up the, the, the borders becomes sort of an easier sell. But then I was thinking, well, you know, they've been trying to do that for, year, for years, <laughs> trying to get the public to, to see international students not as tourists. Um, it's this really tricky thing. So uh, I'll, I'll, I want to sort of bring in the poll here. I've got some in interactive sure. poll. Uh, let's have a look at here. So we've got some questions. Do you feel that other countries are doing better, a better job of supporting international students during COVID-19? 37% say unsure. 33% say yes, I think so. Uh, we've got, um, and it's still live. You can still vote. Uh, what do you feel is the overwhelming kind of message about Australia that current international students are spreading around the world at this time? Uh, well, 67% believe that it's mainly negative messages and 33% believe that it's positive. Um, do you think that international students understand the level of support and how to access it in Australia? Well, it's almost a tie between not really and yes, somewhat. <laughs> 36% for not really and 37% for yes, somewhat. Last question we have here is, um, how do you feel the sector acted to outline support measures, um, support measures for, for in, in international students? 46% said somewhat too slow and uh, followed, oh, 45% said that now. So yeah, there seems to be, certainly in this sort of small group of a couple of hundred attendees, they believe that the, the, the sector acted too slow, but, but in, the, in the vacuum of, of a national approach that was sort of coordinated, as you alluded to, um, that was that was always going to happen. I guess it's really difficult. Um, I'll move on a little bit regarding the the Ellicos and vet students as well. I mean, yeah. well, that's not an easy area. I mean, Ellicos, sort of the canary in the coal mine. I guess many people have said that um, you know it's a it's it's an indication of the success of the whole sector. Whether the Ellicos sector is is able to get to get through this right now, they're being really ravaged. Uh, but the students themselves are. Are struggling big time. Um, these are these are institutions that are not going to be able to provide big hardship funds and things like that, and they're going to be looking for for ways to get support. How's uh, how's CISA sort of trying to look after them, and how's that how are their needs sort of different from your perspective? Yeah, oh, look, we, we've done several things. One of them was we have invited uh, student leaders from Ellicott Event and TAFE sector to our roundtable meetings, uh, which has been. Uh, happening regularly and I think we will, we will have the fourth one um, this week and we, we roundtable came together they have also built a working group of international students working for disseminating information so uh, I think we have reached about 100 international student um, representatives uh, in our list and uh, and, and there were uh, different issues in you know that TAFE students um, and also in um, you know in Ellicos sector as well so those students have raised some important um, issues with us and, and that wasn't similar to the universities and I think when we look at the sector because Elicos also included um, work and holiday visas and some of the other visa holders as well that they came to country and I think they really took the hit when this um, you know first COVID-19 first started happening and and I'm, I'm, I'm really worried for that you know specific sector and I, you know I, my sympathies are with them 
and, and um, you know, we're, we're, we're pushing and advocating you know, on, on their behalf as well for them to have sustainable uh, future for their organizations and also uh, for them to you know, have uh, good resources for student support. It's a, bit, it's a bit challenging, to be honest, because when you look at the funding arrangements and how they are funded, we, we can see some institutions, they you know, heavily rely on international student numbers. And we you know when the numbers drop for second semester, uh, the, the, the picture doesn't really look good. And you know we're, we're really pushing within the government department as well. You know what can we do in order to support and um, you know sustain that you know those two important sectors. But there is there is work going on behind the scenes, uh, and some of them are like positive work. Uh, but but in terms of students, you know they they've got different issues, uh, and also because they don't have a student union as well, so student advocacy isn't really strong in that type, and also in elico schools. Uh, there is no guild, there is no student union uh, like those in universities. But that has been one of the struggles because we don't really have, you know, uh, a lot of leaders coming up and raising their issues with us. That has been, uh, that has been quite challenging. And and to when we to your earlier point, I think when we look at some of the states and territories, um, they have targeted those schools really well, and I think you know well done on them because. They, you know, not only looked at university students, but they've also looked at, you know, Elikos Vat Tafe and, um, you know, and some of them actually purely focused on uh, those, you know, uh, vulnerable student groups out there. For example, WA and South Australia, uh, they, their funding methods have, you know, included those vulnerable groups and, and, and you know, and some of the other states have um, also done similar work and, and which was good because, uh, usually those students come up to us and say there is always support for university students um, and universities are getting funded by government and also you know revenue from international education but you know they forget about us that's what we've been hearing um, and you know like luckily uh, that you know some states are doing better work and we're also encouraging other states to target those vulnerable uh, groups out there uh, and and as, uh, as as we are speaking, um, I get that question a lot about New South Wales. So I think, um, you know, while I love that the opportunity, I'll clarify. Uh, I've been in touch with them regularly. We we have phone conversations um, every week with the with New South Wales uh, Treasury, uh, and and something is coming up soon. Uh, so uh, there is, you know, within I can't really say too much, uh, but 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 something is something is coming up and. And, and, and there's a big student cohort out there in, in, in New South Wales, and I think they will be um, quite pleased to hear these, uh, some of this stuff. Um, I know, and it's not all, um, you know, uh, doom and gloom. And, you know, we, we've got some good stories as well happening. Uh, you know, not all the politicians are same uh, as well. Like, I, I, I really respect uh, Minister Tin, uh, because when I, sometimes when I put myself in his shoes, I... I can see the struggle that he's facing with. And, and you can see that from his Twitter comments, from his media statement. And, and when I talk to him personally as well, uh, you know, Minister and I were in Lexton in the beginning of this year. Uh, we, were, uh, we were helping uh, those communities who were uh, suffering from uh, bushfire crisis. We were actually building fences. And it was a very interesting picture. And I, you know, looked back and I thought of myself like, I would have never imagined uh, holding a, a steel spear and minister is hammering it down and we are building this face for farmers. I don't think I would have ever imagined that this would have happened when I first came to the country. But, and then I look back and say, you know, look, we've got this great opportunity in Australia. Um, and, and, you know, we've, uh, we've, we've, we've got a great advocacy opportunity. And later on when we were in the car, and this, you know, COVID-19 wasn't that popular um, at that point, but I liked it with the minister. And I said, Minister, I think this is going to become a big issue. And, and he said, I think you're right, Ahmed. Uh, you know, and, and on that day, he had this uh, National Security Council, I think that's the name for it. And, and then he said he, he will flag it up there and they will talk about it. And, uh, you know, we had, we had a conversation there, you know, about the future of the sector and how it would look like um, in about a month or two months. And I, I think some of the things that we discussed came true today. And uh, as, as I said, there are, there are good lads out there, there are good guys out there, uh, there are you know, good individuals out there in the sector, in the community, in, in public helping. And you know, when, when I look back, I think we have, we have had about you know, five years worth of resources and stories you know, done in about a few months. And, and I think we can drive a lot of stories 
from these, you know, past months, you know, from the community about, uh, you know, social license of international education and how international students helped in the community in bushfire crises and in, in COVID-19 as well. I have seen several restaurants offering free food for international students, as you mentioned, and, and there are a lot of things out there as well. Um, but we're, we're just encouraging disseminating information and everybody taking responsibility in, you know, resharing uh, some of these stories. And, you know, you might not be aware, but maybe a story or something that you reshare will be, you know, uh, an international student might be benefiting from it that day. You know, we never know. And I think uh, a great phrase that I've uh, known for a long time is that, you know, there was this, there was, the, there was this big fire and ant was carrying uh, you know, a drop of water um, on its back and trying to rush to the big, you know, fire as big as a mountain. And, you know, the ant was asked, you know, why are you doing this? You know, that, that drop of water is not going to benefit uh, the fire. It's not going to, you know, put it off. And then and at the end uh, says, well, look, at least I've done my job. And I think if we all do our jobs and if we all do, you know, what, what we can to the best of our abilities, I think, uh, you know, we really have a, um, you know, bright future ahead. Yeah, that's a that's a lovely positive attitude. I mean, if you go to an individual level, do you, do you have you seen some of these stories bubbling up of of students really stepping up and 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 trying to turn this pandemic into a I don't know an opportunity or 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 they're, they're pivoting their their their, their approach to a, stu a study in Australia. I'd love to hear some some anecdotes of what what, what you've heard. Yeah, oh, look, I think one of the first things we hear is this is the great meme era. Um, you know, there were a lot of memes online shared, a lot of, um, you know, really funny stuff that was shared because of the isolation, because of, uh, because of people, you know, just being stuck home. Um, there's a lot of funny stuff out there. And I think I really appreciate that people sharing it because it, it makes people smile. You know, it brightens their day, it makes their day, um, you know, a, in, a, in a better perspective. And when we, when we look at some of these stories, um, we have, we've heard students saying, um, it really helped me because uh, some of them involved in free courses. Uh, they say, you know, I, I finished the books that I had in my lists. I in enrolled in free courses. I completed them. Uh, I trained myself. And some people say, oh, I needed a break and I had this opportunity and I took a break and I feel more relaxed now. And they say, oh, I feel more relaxed that now I'm too bored and I'm looking for something to do. Uh, and we are hearing this from a lot of people as well. They are looking forward to uh, you know, the relieving of, of restrictions. Uh, we, we've also heard stories in, in neighborhoods where when this toilet paper war was um, happening, uh, people, neighbors were sharing toilet papers with each other. They were dropping it in their, uh, at their doors or uh, we've, we've heard, we've seen those knots that, you know, some people share, uh, you know, to their neighbor saying, hey, if you need help, uh, please let me know. I go for shopping. I can buy stuff and drop it at, at your door if you really need to. Um, and and it was it was it was really moving. It was it was really a proof um, that you know international education is not only about numbers or finances or or dollar figure. It's not only about the certificate that you're getting out of this. It was more about you know the, the Australian way of life, cultural experience, and and how community has. Uh, you know, live together with international students in, in harmonious way. Uh, and yeah. it's true that people like to talk about uh, good things for a day and they, they like to talk about bad things for days and weeks and months. Yeah, I've certainly seen a whole bunch of students come forward to us uh, in, in terms of uh, positive, I guess, I guess there's this lovely sense of humanity coming out. I mean, from the from just the community at large as well. There's, there's people opening up their, their homes and offering sort of discounted homestays. There's food banks off, uh, opening up at, uh, at, a, at Tate Queensland. There's Study Melbourne that are doing their, uh, their Study Melbourne Leadership Labs, which is online workshops with mental health. It's just so many interesting things coming out. And then the students themselves are doing all sorts of interesting things. I'm, I'm noticing some of them are, are starting businesses some of them are, um, you know, they're not waiting around to, to, to get a job when this is all over. They're going to create their own job. They're, they're, they're getting skilled up on, you know, everything from MyOb, Zero, Salesforce, like these, these really important pieces of software. They're getting skilled up. And uh, I love what Cease is doing with your employability workshops and things like that. I think that now's the right, now's the right time um, to, to, to change the expectation 
of what an international education experience really is in Australia. And on that, I'd like to sort of talk a little bit about that. I mean, do you think that the focus of the, on the student experience, I mean, you've, you've got an ex expectation of what a student experience really is when you come to Australia. Do you feel that that has, this, this COVID-19 pandemic has changed what that, what that means for international students? I'm afraid it's, it looks like it's going to change because of this um, online learning narrative and, and not only about the narrative, but only because we misunderstand the picture and uh, a lot of students misunderstand the picture as well. Uh, you know, we just think that it's just going to be an online, online course with uh, just like, you know, th there are a lot of resources, a lot of websites out there who are giving online courses. Um, there are several examples and there are also a lot of, um, universities and institutions in the global uh, platform giving very um, cheap online courses and uh, it is really a difficult market and you know I, I always say that this is not only about the certificate you know it's about the package that you're getting in Australia now believe it or not it's about the air as well the weather the quality of weather safety um, and uh, Australian way of life, cultural experience, part-time job, and, and future employment, definitely. Uh, you know, some of the things that we are focusing on is, yes, they are sh short-term, and um, some of the things which was already done uh, you know, in the sector is short-term as well, and some people call it sugar hit. Um, yeah, maybe it was that way, but we are also hearing stories about long-term impacts as well. We are pushing this internship, um, uh, paid internship program, uh, you know, in, in some states uh, and, you know, in, in the long term, we believe that, yes, it'll be a short term impact because it'll give a bit of sugar hit. Students will be get paid, but also it will it will make them job ready. Um, and, and, you know, when you look at, you know, what we mean by student experience, um, you know, student experience, are we, you know, one of the questions that always comes to my mind is, you know, what would it look like in 10 years? Um, would Australia, um, you know, sustain uh, you know, flexible migration, or would that be too restrictive? Would that impact uh, international education? Would you know things go on more face to online, face to face learning, or um, you know more about you know or, or blended learning? Uh, it's it's an interesting picture, and, and I think we're not the only stakeholders. Uh, and you know, I mean, students are not the only stakeholders for that question, because sector benefits a lot. From uh, international education and mm -hmm. um, you know global uh, other countries uh, are also benefiting from this as well it's a competitive market and it's a volatile market as well it changes so swiftly things might not be the same in you know in next year for example and we are seeing changes and 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 then I think we are adapting to changes as well um, yes yeah, some of sometimes we are a bit uh, reactive rather than proactive um, you know, I mean, don't get me wrong. We, there are areas that we really are the pioneers um, in the sector, in, in the global sector. But there are things that we are quite reactive as well. We, you know, we want other countries to do it, do it first, or other states to do it first, or, or other institutions to do it first. And we, you know, we want to follow it. And we're always encouraging the sector to take initiative and you know take the risks. It's worth it. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm quite hopeful. I think um, things will um, settle. Uh, you know, back into uh, place. Uh, I think there were a lot of improvements on online and embedded learning, uh, and that was a good outcome uh, from this uh, era. And we are hearing and seeing a lot of good improvements. You know, and and quality, uh, you know, quality teaching techniques coming up, and because people are always pushing the ideas uh, because now we are struggling and we, you know, we are looking for uh, ways uh, to, you know, to sustain the, the sector. But, but nevertheless, we, we are hearing from students saying that, you know, we, we, we want to come back to the country. If I wanted to study online, I could have done it at a cheaper uh, price in, in a different institution or a different country. So I yeah. think we really need to be careful about, you know, how we sell the product as well. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a dilemma that is, I think the sector is trying to grapple with now, ma meeting student expectations and really trying to understand, you know, yes, international students signed up for a face-to-face -face experience with, you know, the good weather and, the, and, and on, uh, in, in person learning. But then, you know, 
there was a pandemic and all of a sudden everyone's staying at home. Does that mean the institution should provide cheaper courses? You know, and but they, you know, they've already got these other expenses. So I, I think there's so many things to think about. Um, yeah, I don't have the answers, but we do have a question from Ivy. How does CISA ensure effective communication of information to international students through not through members associations and non-members? How does CISA ensure that international student views across the sectors are being represented in the Global Reputation, Reputation Task Force and Council for International Education? Oh, that's, that's a great question. And, and that was one of the first things that we were, we were discussing when we started our, um, our term. And, uh, you know, because of that, what we've done was this roundtable meeting that we have with international student leaders, they are not restricted to CISA members uh, or they are not restricted to university uh, guilds or unions. We have opened um, the platform to um, other sectors, VET, TAFE, ELICOS, um, you know, other private colleges as well, and even even high schools. We are we are you know in touch with some high high school students and representatives, and you know, and and we are hearing from them, you know, what what they've been suffering as well. So, and and that has been very powerful. Um, the meetings that we've had that with that group has been has been really positive and and, and it, re, it worked really well because it was a round table meeting and we were hearing from everybody every individual so we have encouraged we have said you know use this opportunity to tell us your story use this opportunity um, to say you know what you're suffering and and we can carry that information back to global reputation task force back to other committees and meetings that we are part of and and that's what credible advocacy is about and, and I think that's what uh, CISA's position is and should be um, in, in, the, in the sector. It shouldn't be only restricted to few individuals. Um, it, should be, you know, it should be covering um, the whole sector, you know, all this over 700,000 international students. And, and that, that has been our aim since day one. You know, how do we get to all, all of these schools, colleges, all of these students? And you know, we are constantly pushing ourselves to find some avenues where we can you know transfer the information we can how we can involve more people uh, on board and and then you know it has been a challenging process you know getting to know about uh you know some of these schools and individuals but what we've done was for example in this round table meeting we have asked every individual to bring three representatives for the next meeting for example so we have given responsibility for everybody. So we, we've got a bit of homework um, to do ourselves as well. We, we, we are constantly you know, looking for friends and uh, other institution leaders you know, where we can invite to the meeting. And we are also um, inviting sector leaders to our meetings as well, uh, both from the department, from government, and also from the private sector. Uh, you know, we, have, uh, uh, we have expert in migration law, um, you know, coming to our meetings as an observer and also as a guest um, to speak. Uh, we have, you know, whenever we see an opportunity, uh, we have also, you know, talked to Texta and I said, you know, how can we, uh, you know, get some of your work out there as well. So we, we, we are in touch with some of these organizations. Hmm. Well, that's a, um, it's, it's great to hear because uh, there's one thing to set up a student run organization. There's another one to run it across Australia. And then it's even, it's another level to actually engage the different levels of education. So hats off to you guys. Well done. The, um, from Paulina, I've read many international students on social media telling other students who plan on coming to Australia that they should find another country because Australia doesn't care about them. What are your thoughts on this? And what, 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 what more can we do to ensure the positive experiences of studying in Australia are shared? Hmm, I think, Every international student is an influencer and, and I see them as ambassador of their countries. And when they return to their countries, they, they become the ambassador of, um, you know, for Australia um, as well. Uh, you know, we, we have a great alumni um, group. I'm, I'm in touch with some of the former CISA executives as well and, and hearing from what they have been doing in different countries. And I, I think, you know, social media is, a, is, is an important platform for us for sharing our stories um, you know, we've we have a great representation listening to us you know on those platforms in Australia and also offshore as well like uh, one individual international student uh, has a great network in Australia and also a great network 
back home in their countries as well. And and when you look at the socio economic level, they all they also have a friend um, or a family member or a relative who's thinking to come and study in Australia too, because they're aware that you know their friend is there. And you know, word of mouth is quite important um, in international education. Um, you know, tell tell about your you know tell them about your experience. You know, whether it's good or bad. Uh, you know, feel free to be critical as well. Also, tell but at the same time, tell about um, the things that's on your mind as well. Your questions, you know, challenge your audience. Um, I think uh, you know the world is changing. Uh, things are we are in you know in, in information age now, and uh, you know knowledge is out there. You know, it's available. You know, feel free to challenge your audience. And I think uh, I also see here um, you know questions along the same line as well. Uh, that uh, you know about some of these about online learning, um, and uh, you know, and, and some so, some of them are, are about the tuition fees as well. Um, I, I think it was a couple of days ago. One of the vice chancellors uh, from Queensland, uh, you know, has done an article, and on the same article there are my comments as well. And, and what he said was, he said, we can't expect international students to pay the same fee uh, for, you know, second uh, intake. And, and, and he's right, uh, because students are aware, you know, it's not diff it's different than five or 10 years ago. Students are up to the knowledge. They research, uh, their families research as well. They know what's going on in the global market. They know what's going on in Australia. So uh, they are well informed. We can't uh, treat them uh, like they are unaware of, uh, you know, <laughs> what's going on. So. And, and I think we really need to be careful about our empathy because uh, we either increase the quality of something if we want to sell it for the same price. And if you increase the quality of something, you really need to prove that you have incre increased the quality. Or if you can't bring the same service, and I think you should be double thinking about your uh, tuition fees and, and, and you know how much you cost. and at the end of the day students are aware of what's happening um, and, and they will decide uh, but there are vulnerable groups out there like, like let's say you have already done three years of your degree and you're in your last year and you know you don't want to go somewhere else because you only have you know a few units left till you graduate you have already paid maybe let's say seventy five thousand um, dollars you know and, and you've got a few thousand dollars uh, you know of your investment left to spend so if you go to another institution uh, our accreditation within Australia is not that easy, uh, and our accreditation, you know, within different countries is not that easy as well. You know, it is very difficult. If you try to go to another university to study, they only count lim you know limited number of units, uh, you know, as, as a credit recognized learning, and you will you will still have to do much more. So those are some of the vulnerable groups out there. But I think the new intake, the future students. Um, they they will have more agency they will have more power of their decisions hmm. yes uh, i think it's going to be interesting with that 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 second semester especially like if they do if they do open the borders the question will be how different will the experience be for a student and will it actually meet their expectations but then if you think about it then the institutions will have to predict what that second semester may look like change their offering, change the price, and then compete on a global scale before the student actually leaves their home country. That is going to be a minefield. So I'm actually, um, uh, hats off to the people who are tuned in from the recruitment teams at, at institutions around Australia, because that is going to be uh, a, a, certainly a challenge uh, to, to get that marketing out there. Um, yeah, hopefully we, we can help it inside a guy and get done. I have a question here from Doris and Jeffrey. Do you think that there's a possibility for students to actually come in July? Do you actually think that's going to happen? Um, I think it will. Uh, you know, from from my chat with Ellen Touch, Minister Touch, um, it, it it looks like it will happen. But I think it's clever politics as well. You know, you're giving power to uh, institutions and states to come up with their projects and say. Uh, you know, this is what I see the picture, and this is how it will work step by step. And you include the proposal uh, and advice from different departments, from police, from health, and you build that package and say, okay, this is where they will quarantine, um, and this is the time period, 
and this is how we will open our you know um, campuses and schools and this will be the precautions that we are setting and at the end of the day federal government uh, is not going to lose anything out of it because the proposal is going to come from the uh, private sector and and then we already have south australia uh, you know putting their hands up and and you know with this uh, proposal and idea and, and to be the pilot project and and it looks like uh, you know uh, south australia might be one of the first ones to open their doors and you know I'm, I'm well, I, think, I, think, I think we're getting an exclusive here from from you ahmed uh, well, I'm, I'm not from adelaide by the way <laughs> and I'm, I'm not sponsored by adelaide but uh, let me be clear on that i'm from perth and and, and I'm from Curtin University, yeah. uh, but but yes, I, I just you know can't ignore and notice that I'm I'm just very intrigued. I'm just wondering how it's going to look like. Mm. Well, I mean, I've I've got one last question here uh, that I want to ask you. We talked to Rob Lawrence last week. He was an absolute um, legend in this game of of international yeah. international education. He talked about the the key driver for students wanting to study in in Australia, based on his most recent massive study was the ease of obtaining work after graduating. So you've been, I know you guys have been running some employability seminars and uh, I mean, do, do you think finding work post-study will, I mean, considering all these challenges, OSHC, mental health, internships, financial assistance, all these issues that CESA are now identifying, do you think there will be students that that will still be a concern for them moving forward? Definitely. I think one issue will be the visa. And second issue will be finding job. Uh, and the third issue will be the social license and what public is going to say about it. With the visa, uh, because let's say you're a graduate student and you're stuck outside the country, uh, because the legislation only allows you to apply for post-study work rights when you're in Australia, uh, Home Affairs is developing this legislative instrument to allow those people to apply uh, for that you know, PSWR when they're outside the country. And and we, we are looking forward to hearing you know more news out of, you know out of that and see if it's really going to happen and how it's going to look like. Uh, and of course, there's an increase in uh, in unemployment rates and uh, it's a national uh, picture now. And there will be a debate and there will be a political debate about you know whether it, from public and from from the parliaments as well whether you know, we should give opportunities to international students. And I think there's going to be restriction there. And, you know, I'm, I'm, and I'm really afraid of that. Uh, and and th that's why we need to tell the story uh, in, in a really better way and more and more that, you know, look, they are not burdened. They are taxpayers as well. They contribute significantly to the country. And, of course, finding job is going to be tricky. You know, you're going to be in a competitive environment. You know, we are hearing from... Uh, international students every day even like last night I had a chat with an international student um, who was telling me that they are not able to find job because it's so competitive out there and um, you know people prefer domestic uh, you know graduates or or people with citizenships uh, it's, it's, I think it's going to be even more difficult finding job you know after this pandemic uh, you know both for graduates and also for part-time as well uh, and, and to be honest, we, we need to we need to be preparing for that. Yeah, I think that whole uh, post uh, post study work is going to be a, a, an area of real uh, friction for for the politicians. Um, yeah, I hope I hope I, I wish you all the best, and I, I hope it all works out for you. Uh, we'll have a a quick go look at these polls again, just to see if anything's changed. Uh, number one, do you feel that other countries are doing a better job of supporting international students? Uh, the winner is. Oh, unsure. <laughs> Followed closely by yes. Yes, I think so. Number two, what do you feel is the overwhelming kind of message about Australian, uh, that, is, that international students are sending out about Australia? 66% think it is negative messaging. Um, number three, do you think international students understand the level of support? It's all, it's still, it's a tie between not really and yes, somewhat. So that's actually a really interesting answer. We have a, it seems to be some serious confusion around yes everyone knows yes students know what the what support is and yes where to get it versus uh, no they don't they have absolutely no idea it, it, it is, and then you're saying even if they do then then they're not necessarily eligible for both and um it's yeah i think that the the, the how you articulate the support is going to be the next challenge in terms of student support. That'll be the next like week or two of just trying to sort that out. 
one of the one of the, um, those things. Um, how do you feel the sector acted? Uh, and um, 45% said somewhat too slow. And that was the winner. There you go. Well, look, I want to thank you all again for joining us. And thank you so much, Ahmed. Thank you for having me. I think the, the questions were, were really interesting and, and seeing those answers, uh, I think it'll help us determine some of these advocacy areas and, and I'll, I'll make sure that I'll raise that in Slack with uh, some of the government departments as well. But, but thank, thanks, thanks for having me and thanks to, uh, to the audience as well. No problem. Hey, look, I want to thank you all again for joining our webinar series. We'll be back uh, maybe next week, maybe the week after. Uh, it's sort of a, we have industry chats as well on our YouTube channel, which we will send. We, we just did one. We've done them with Craig Foster from SBS. We did one yesterday with Dirk Mulder from Perth. And, and really, it's just an interesting way to, to, to keep a pulse on, on what's going on in the sector. Uh, I put them up on my LinkedIn and then we put them up on YouTube as well. We'll put this one up on YouTube as well and we'll send you all the links. So feel free to subscribe, like that channel. It's just starting out, but really it's a way to, 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 to keep the conversation going. And uh, yeah, I look forward to seeing you all in the next one. This is absolutely fantastic way to do it and um, we're gonna keep doing it. So again, see you all later.